all inspired by Matthew 25, where God said, "When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I'm naked, you clothed me. When I am in a prison, you visited me. When I was sick, and we followed all that." You name yourself buckets for Jesus. There was that voice behind me. It says there was a light that I couldn't look because it was so bright, and says this is your name. That buckets is your ministry. Buckets for Jesus is a non-profit organization, and how we started was from our own family, the, just the four of us, me, my wife Ruby, and our two children. Hi, my name is Ruby. Uh, so I am maiden name Bukoy from the Philippines, born there, uh, but was raised uh, outside the country, and I came to Australia 20 years ago. And uh, about two years later, I received a vision in a dream um, that um, was very vivid in my mind until today. It was a sea of buckets. I saw this sea of buckets that endless, and I asked, "What is this about? What is the meaning?" And it's there's a voice behind me that says. I looked closer, and the voice was saying, "You are to take that to the poorest of the poor." And they were that vision was a, a vision of buckets, uh, and in the bucket, when I looked, it had basic necessities, it had um, food, clothes, but most of all, it had the, the Bible, the rosary on top of it, and to take it to the to my country of birth for the first instruction. And then to other countries later on, which I have to wait for instruction. It was so clear that I remembered it the moment I woke up, and immediately told my husband about it. And so I said, "What should we do?" You know, and he said, "Well, we wait and pray. You know, we can discern it." Of course, when she first brought it up, we were a bit hesitant and. Not prepared for this kind of mission work at all. But after a while and praying and thinking about it, we decided to give it a go, and that's how we started Buckets for Jesus. As and it's been almost thirteen years now. We planned the first mission. It was very, very、um, scary. Uh, there was so much fear of the beyond and、um, the unknown. And、uh, although I was born in the Philippines, I've never been really exposed to the poor, like as in dealing with them and talking to them. It was always、uh, like dangerous to go to the slums, and we try not to be involved so much. Also, because I want them to feel what the mission is going to be about for the for the Lord and for the impact that it will give us. So the the first trip was of course very frightening, and、uh, we have to visit prisons and places that we never planned to do. But because when we were in the Philippines, we depend on God to guide us. Where to go? When we go there, we have to bring some things so that we can, like Bibles and clothing or whatever we can bring, to give out while we are there to the poor people. First travel arrangement that we did, and so we had to book the Malaysian Airlines, and then we realized that we were going to be over. Loaded with baggage because we were going to bring all kinds of mission gears, Bibles, rosaries, all kinds of just clothes, whatever we can take and get hold of. There were four of us. If 
if you get 30 kilos, you only get like 120 kilos. So I said, it's impossible. You won't have the money to pay for excess luggage. So that was like so amazing that when we are, we, the spirit of boldness came upon us, especially for me. I, I just started writing to so many people, including the airline. <laughs> I'm not sure whether they will actually support us, you know, <laughs> but I trust you and that you will touch them. We received a, an email from the GM at that time uh, on that first trip. And again, that was to me the turning point when this person who wrote back, he's a GM, actually said, come and pick up a letter from me. And I said, hmm, because I know Malaysian Airlines in the middle of the city. It's very hard to, to uh, park, etc. So I told my husband, can you bring me there and you wait the car. So I came down with the letter and the letter just says, no limit. I like, what? No limit? What does it mean? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Does it mean we can carry anything we want, you know? Then, of course, deep inside my heart, God is telling me, yeah, yeah, you don't believe me, that's why. <laughs> anyway, we still were unsure whether they would let us have all the luggage. So we rallied a friend who had a big van to bring all the equipments and whatever gears we had in his van. And just as a fallback plan, in case it doesn't go through, we won't have to carry them and pay for it. There was a commotion at the back of the counter, the check-in counter, when we presented that letter. And uh, all in, uh, in the language and all that was big commotion. And I said, oh, oh, looks like we look at each other. Thank God we brought a van, you know. But lo and behold, they actually said, OK, bring it in. We will not let charge you any excess luggage. And the lady was telling me, I don't know what you did, but I just want you to know, this is the first time this has ever happened. And I said, oh, I hope I haven't caused you any trouble. And you know what he said? She said, well, the person who wrote this letter has already left the company. And the, the, the day that I received that letter, that's why he asked me personally to pick up the letter, it was his last day of work. And he wanted to make sure that the letter is honored. Because if he sends an email, his email would have been wiped out in the system by the end. So he made sure it was a concrete instruction to give us that help. He has left, and yet, the miracle is everything happened according to the plan to God intervene. And the same thing with um, our accommodation. So we had so much problem with the cost of accommodation. It was just so mind boggling. And so again, I was told to write to the hotel that we used to be associated with, which is Fraser's, uh, Fraser Place in, the, in Makati. It's a five-star service apartment hotel that we designed some in the early 2000. And again, there was like a big sign and a miracle for us that not only they gave us accommodation, but they actually hosted us for free. And it happened immediately on that first trip. And for the next 10 years, they were there to support us. No matter how many trips we go to the Philippines for mission, they will still welcome us and uh, host us. And that was the beginning of our mission. When we reached the Philippines for the first time, he just led us to people and places that, where he wanted us to go. It was so amazing. Okay, I first met uh, uh, Michael, Ruby, Mick and Camilla in 1992 when I moved from Sydney to, to Perth to join the uh, team called the Youth Mission Team. And we moved into Wembley Downs and the parish was City Beach. 
and uh, the family went to that, that parish, Holy Spirit Parish, and Mick was a, an acolyte and a young young boy on that, that occasion, on that, 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 that time. But over the years I've kept in, in contact and then they developed the, the ministry called Buckets uh, for Jesus in 2010 to, um, to, to minister to the poor in the, the Philippines. I, I have a soft spot for the Philippines. I, I lived there for three and a half years in a, in a seminary uh, from 1993 to 1997. And so I'm very aware of the, the poverty there and the, and the people. And uh, that, that uh, very much touches, touches my heart. And, uh, and so I'm very, very supportive and very honoured to be the chaplain for Buckets uh, for, for Jesus. Yeah, the first trip really was instrumental to the growth of, the, of our ministry. It inspired us, it motivated us, it gave us the spirit of boldness to ask, it gave us the spirit of being really unafraid. That was the main thing. After each mission work, she would come back very distressed because of the level of poverty and, uh, and the level of neglect um, of the people uh, by those who should have done better. You know, you know, um, relief organisations or, or government agencies. And, uh, and, and each, each time she would wonder if she had the strength to go back again because it was, it was that really, she would be affected so deeply by that, but of course she would, she would continue to, to go back. And, uh, and my advice was always to, to go back, don't, don't give up the people, the people need you. We inform all our closest friends about our plans. And in that first mission alone, we received so many defining moments. First is that people were very supportive uh, all our friends and families, they rallied to, to support us, uh, our parish. After the first earlier years, we have to bring all this luggage along with us, which becomes quite troublesome and expensive. So, And uh, after a while, I have this vision that why not we have a warehouse and then collect all these donations and put them in a container and send over because that was help us with so many things to carry with us. And how it started was we are designers and architects and we were doing a fitting up a five-star hotel in Perth a big one and because the furnitures all come from China and there are many boxes that they come in which we have to crush it and throw and, and pay to get rid of it. So one of the thoughts we have was why don't we keep all these boxes and fill it with clothes and other things that people donate, put it in a container and, and send it over to the Philippines. Well that really helps a lot and that's how we started with sending containers over and uh, at the end we all in all we sent about 30 containers to the Philippines. With that container we were able to reach out to even a multitude of needy people. It was like God said there's no more limit to that. There's so much inside our own container. It's like 25 tons of things, you know, not just a school bag. But in the last 10 years, the school bag became the focus of our ministry, apart from the housing, because of the impact that it is bringing into the lives of the children on the street. We have seen with our own eyes how children on the street, like at that time, maybe about 4 million of them on the street. They're all over. The moment you stop your car in a traffic light, Boom, they all show up, you know, begging, selling something and all that. It was very heartbreaking, but to, which, which means if they're on the street, they can't go to school. The school bags go to um, the remotest of remote places. All these children are looked after by ministries. 
missionaries of charity, missionaries of the poor, uh, MGLs, and all, all these, uh, those group of people, they regularly get school bags from us because they have new intake of young street children every year. So they, they, they help us to reach out to these people, to these little children. So the, the, the bags may seem quite simple and very, um, uh, to, to some people, maybe not too meaningful, but when it reaches the hands of the poor, it is so like the world for them, you know? To be able to receive something, to be able to go to school uh, year after year, and of course, education is a main thing, or well, I feel it is, and this is why this charity is doing um, such a marvellous job, because education um, builds confidence, and confidence builds hope. And a lot of these children um, really, really don't have any hope until they see that they're getting this support and it's just amazing to see their faces when they get the bags and they're just so, so grateful. And hopefully we can continue on with the ministry and be support the ministry so that we can um, give the children in need um, the chance to go to school and have an education. Uh, and we just feel it's a, a wonderful ministry to be involved in to, uh, to really help children out who need all these beautiful school items, so much more than we do. Such, uh, such a little amount of things that we give can bring such joy um, and such a rich education for kids. So, pleasure to be involved in this ministry. We walked into the slums, we walked into provincial hospitals, and the most scary one was going into the prison the prisons. Luckily, we have a few priests who were ministering to the prisons who brought us in. And in Malabon, there's the worst prison I've ever seen. I think a room like this would have like probably a um, hundred, a hundred inmates, you know. And there's like in the middle of the room, a toilet bowl and a cubicle, not even private like just one wall and a, a curtain on this side where they could do their sanitation work and all that. The whole place stung and the whole place was like so hellish. So we also gave a little money to the priests so that they could send telegram to their families. You know. Things that we did on that first trip, we, the buckets really arrived into the hands of the poor. In the hospitals, it's the same. We brought them food because they, um, there was not enough food given to the patients there, the sick people. And sometimes their families are sitting there also hungry, you know. Just so heartbreaking. And so we started the movement of giving, but also at the same time, we tried to solve the problem of sustainability. You know, like how long can we sustain giving them? I mean, ours is probably by one or two visits a year, but how about them, you know? So we tried to connect to people who will continue our mission locally, uh, who would, like we connect with some churches, we connect with some organizations, NGOs, who can um, continue the, the mission that we started. So they follow us wherever we go, and we came back, raise money, whatever we can, so that we can help these groups, so that they can also continue the, the work that we started. Ruby has taught me a lot about that many times when uh, she has um, asked us to pray uh, so that more money would come in, uh, for example, um, for to be able to send the containers, um, or um, 
she she would say, oh, this great donation uh, has just come in a whole lot of um, books and pencil cases, just almost out of nowhere. But we know that it's not really out of nowhere. It's through the prayers of um, anyone who is involved. Um, prayer um, does wonderful things. Yeah, but buckets for Jesus, they, um, they, they are known by the Archbishop, by the, um, the hierarchy in the diocese and uh, who, who support their um, mission. The, the local Catholic paper has done uh, articles, articles on them and uh, very supportive. And most of it was during the Typhoon Haiyan period where the people then need a lot of help and things. So we even got Singapore to send containers of food and clothing to assist all those they are affected by the flood victim. So that was a very rewarding exercise and it's good to see that all the good things are not gone to waste because in Australia when we walk around we saw the grass on the verge collection, so many things that are still useful but it's all going to be thrown away. And sometimes we drive around and pick up things that we think can be of use in the Philippines. That's where we started to collect, they call it junk, but it's very usable things in the Philippines and they really appreciate that very much. Because of all these many donations we have, we come up, my other partner Ruby came up with the idea of doing a boutique op shop here where we can sell all the excess donations that we think can help to raise funds for our mission work. And that's how we started the BFJ Mercy and Mission Boutique Op Shop. I'm here at the Buckets for Jesus Boutique Op Shop where as you can see there's a lot of things for sale and this place is not only used as a boutique op shop. We also do our ministry work here, especially by packing the school bags to send to the children in the Philippines, which we've been doing for I think about eight or so years now. So and it's blessed, this ministry has blessed tens of thousands of street children and also in this place, we have the op shop which goes every Saturday and we have signs that are put outside that will help draw the crowds in and we advertise what our op shop sells on social media as well. It attracts members of the public. They come in, they try clothes, they have a browse around, they even buy things to support our ministry work. Sometimes on a Saturday morning uh, when they have time uh, to pack the bags and also pack the boxes and we support any fundraising events that go on. Um, again, we go out to the community and try and get as many people involved. And not many of them are believers in the faith. And they are, when they do come in and they see our posters on the wall about our ministry work, and they even found out that all whatever they buy in this place goes to a good cause, they are inspired and touched to support what we do in our ministry work. I've been with this ministry, Bucket for Jesus, for about eight years. And I enjoy myself going to this ministry and helping with all the sorting out all the donations and sharing, you know, uh, meals with the people who are there. Our mission work also expanded in the Singapore area. Friends and families there started school bags for Jesus as well. It became a door-to-door -door, uh, experience where everyone gets it on their mission. So those people who are receiving them, like all our mission partners, it was like a miracle for them. Another um, aspect was a, a great um, typhoon or a great wind or a great storm. In fact, the strongest storm or strongest wind that, that ever hit um, the planet uh, devastated the, the Philippines. 11 million, I think 11 million people were 
um, affected, according to the United Nations, I think it was the United Nations or some uh, report, um, an official report said that 11 million people were affected and millions of people were left homeless. And so the Buckets for Jesus team organised the building of houses, I think about 50 um, portable houses to be, to be built. And it's a good thing that we have our architectural background. So we decided to plan out firstly how to build these homes. And uh, it started with like a four by six meters home with just a toilet and a kitchenette. But this does give accommodation and a roof over the head for many families there who are really homeless. And, and to, the other challenge was how to give, who to give all these homes to. So with that, we have to discuss and talk with the mayor of the city and also the priests there so that we can uh, uh, supply them to the Genoai people who really need a home over their head. The most important thing is we also give them Bibles and rosaries and uh, we also got somebody to sponsor and build a chapel uh, to, to help them with their spiritual life. And uh, I just want very, very uh, touched to share with you that these families pray the rosary for their donors. Every, every month, they dedicate their prayers for the people who gave the money to, to have their homes built. So it is, I look back as an architect, I have done so many big jobs, but this housing project is very humble houses to me is the most amazing project I've ever done. Until eventually God showed us that the children are most important. Focus on them, build a kind of an army for me, a new army that knows me, that knows the word. So give them the Bible, give them, give them what they need, give them school supplies if they can't go to school. So with with that vision, the first vision, it was, the name of the of Buckets for Jesus was given to us. You name yourself Buckets for Jesus. There was that voice behind me. It says, there was a light that I couldn't look because it was so bright. And says, this is your name. That Buckets is, is your ministry. That's your name. You go there two by two, even if there's just two of you. Don't affiliate or connect yourself to any organization. Just do it. We underestimate a lot of the time uh, how powerful prayer is. So through this um, ministry, I have learned to, be, to become more giving and it has given me the opportunity to put my faith into practice. I was really grateful that God called them. God called my husband. God touched my, our son and our daughter. And together, just four of us, we went on the first mission. And on that mission alone, which we define as bringing the buckets of joy to the poor, bringing the Word of God in the flesh, and uh, making them know that God loves them. Around 2010, after they uh, began the, the mission, uh, somewhere about that time, they um, asked me to be the uh, spiritual director for Buckets uh, for Jesus. And my heart um, was, is completely in support. And I want to support them as much as I can. I strongly believe in, in them as a family and, and, and in their mission uh, to, the, to the Philippines. My heart is, is very much uh, for, for that, that mission. So I'm very honoured um, to be a spiritual director. I don't know if, if I'm worthy to be such a, the spiritual director, but... Uh... Don't be afraid. So there was that verse again that was given to us, which was very, very powerful. It was Isaiah 41 verse 10, do not be afraid. I will hold you, I will uplift you, I will protect you, I will be with you.